I did all surgeries, or assisted on all surgeries except for eyes and hearts. And one of the nurse uh, nurses that was one of the great scrubs said, you would love heart surgery. Hi, welcome to eShadowing, guys. Hi, I'm Rodalyn. As you all know, I'm the host for our shadowing session, as always. And tonight, I have Mr. or PA Ed Donahue. Thank you so much for coming on, Mr. Donahue. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so you guys may not know, Ed's been a PA for over... 40 years now, since 1980, and uh, most of his uh, work has been in cardiac surgery and critical care. So we're excited to learn about his career, um, how the PA uh, career has changed over the past 40 years. Uh, so thank you, thank you again, Ed, for being here. Um, so to start off, can you tell us about why you chose PA, especially um, in the you know seven, late 70s to 80s when it was such a new career? I, I can't tell you how lucky and fortunate I am. Um, back in, I uh, graduated high school in 75 and uh, my father wanted me to go to college and I wanted to be an auto mechanic. So he won. So I, he said, after you get out, you can be a mechanic. So when I was in uh, sophomore year, uh, I ran into a PA, PA student who was a Navy corpsman in uh, Vietnam War, and that's the, actually the genesis of um, PA profession was the yeah. corpsman, what do you do with them? And they trained him up and it was successful. So he was actually a live one. He was my RA on the floor. So he told me about it and I was, yeah, he said he'd love to get back in surgery. I said, I want to use my hands. I can do a people surgery. Like, I mean, you know, people repair as opposed to auto repair. And you know, instead of grease on your fingers, you got blood. And then, uh, OK, I can do that. So fortunately, I had it in my school. So I directed all my coursework um, to becoming a PA out of there and took five years and uh, one summer of two biology classes back home and uh, graduated uh, my biology degree and then finished my clinical in 1980. And back then, they only gave you a physician assistant certificate. Right. So I said, OK, and uh, start off. Right. Yeah, I actually saw that um, while doing research on your course. Um, so did you have I saw that you had you went back and got your master's. Was it like completing a PA program again or like how did that work? Um, with all that schooling over the five years, I had like 171 semester hours. Mm -hmm. So I um, somewhere in the early 2000s, I uh, was teaching nurse practitioners to become master's degree. I said, whoa, you know, I don't even have a bachelor's in PA. How do I fix that? So I talked to my program director. She was still there. And um, they said, they are not set up. I said, I'll do anything to get grandfathered in or this or that. And she directed me to uh, Nebraska. And they have, um, it wasn't actually online at the time. They had distance learning master's degree. And um, it took one year and a lot of hoops of papers and research and et cetera. So I got that in 2002, I believe. Yes. Yeah, I saw that. That's amazing. I'm glad that you were able to be grandfathered in or, you know, it was a, a easier transition than kind of going back to school and having to do, you know, any other tedious work. <laughs> right. Their philosophy was if you've been a PA that long, like, for instance, I've passed boards six or seven times. You know, everybody's freaking out passing boards the first time. So, and I did too. But um, so they're giving you credit um, that you've learned a lot and doing your CME every two years, 100 hours. So yeah. it added up to, OK, we can do distance for uh, experienced PAs, distance learning. Right. OK. Um, so when you had to um, apply to PA school back in, you know, the late 70s, 78, <laughs> Um, did you need patient care hours then? Like, how was the application process? Do you it, it, remember? It, you know, this experience, like you guys are all for uh, shadowing hours, they wanted some experience. So over Christmas, I was in an or orderly assistant at the local hospital. And then I escorted patients in the afternoon to their room from admissions. And I think I only did like two weeks, but back then they didn't require much experience. And I was in the sixth class, I believe. And 
on when you start a, a PA program, they let the first five classes sit for boards. Mm -hmm. So I was on the, the AMA came and interviewed us our first semester. And if our school did not get reaccredited for sixth year on, we would have wasted that year got semester hours, but we wouldn't be enabled to be in PAs. Right. right. So um, there were only eight in our class. Eight PAs? Eight in the class. One guy quit the first week because he talked to the people from last year that didn't get jobs. And one of the corpsmen had three children and he had experience, but uh, you have to do book work right. and he just couldn't focus. So we graduated six of us. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Nowadays, PA programs are like 60 and up. Yeah, they got 72 in this year's class. Wow. What school was it again? I'm sorry. King's College in Northern oh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, it's not King's College in New York. It's in Pennsylvania. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. I know there's a King's College in New York. Okay. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that. So um, how was PA school? I know it was only um, eight of you that graduated. So how was it? Like kind of going through didactic and clinical year. How did they set that up? What was your favorite class? What was your least favorite? If you remember. My least favorite was um, pediatrics because it was a night class um, right at six o'clock to nine and it was right after supper. And can you imagine we were taking turns falling asleep on this boring pediatrician who was giving us his time we felt terrible about it but it was just hard to stay awake at that time of day yeah um, there was a surgeon that taught us um pulmonary and um he was great he and we i actually followed and watched him in the or a couple of times and that was a lot of fun but uh, we didn't have all the uh specialties that you have now Right. And some of the medicines and it was different like we we didn't have the internet so when we wanted to listen to heart sounds we had the VHS big tapes that this big to listen to and VHS tapes of the lectures of um, Hahnemann in Philadelphia for infectious disease, et cetera, et cetera, the courses that we couldn't cover. Oh my goodness. That's insane. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I was trying to remember what a VHS tape looks like, but I remember now. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> okay, so um, what about clinicals? How, how, what kind of clinicals did you have and how long were your clinicals? The clinicals were a month. First, during our first year, um, the uh, program director had worked in the local um, <clears throat> nursing home and she was able to take us one half a day once a week to do physical exams on real patients and get, get the feel of using the stethoscope and your otoscope, et cetera. So yeah, that was great. And then um, after that, we did a month of each rotation. And uh, we went first six months, the local VA was right there. So you did inpatient psych and you did um, medicine and two months of surgery, two weeks of orthopedic surgery and two weeks of urology. And then other hospitals around the area, you did internal medicine. We did outpatient psych, ER medicine at the local hospital. And there's a few others I, I don't remember. Right. But it, it was fine. It was fun. Okay. All right. So I'm um, now transitioning to actually someone had a good, oh, we'll answer that later, actually. But now transitioning to, you know, graduating PA school and kind of getting out there in the work world. I know you had an interest in cardiac surgery. How easy was it to get a job as a new grad back then? Well, my first job, I was a first assistant for a hospital and um, I did all surgeries or assisted on all surgeries except for eyes and hearts. And one of the nurse uh, nurses that was one of the great scrubs said, you would love heart surgery. And because um, she had been across the river and had worked with the place that did heart surgery and you would just love it. And she's absolutely right. I just have loved it from day one. I actually moved my wife 1200 miles, six months pregnant to my first job mm -hmm. and had never seen a heart surgery yet. And they didn't have YouTube back then. <laughs> so I had huge faith in this woman and it, she turned out to be right. Wow. But um, I, I didn't think I could get a job. Actually, I interviewed in that job in January and they supposedly hired the other guy. Then they called back and talked to my wife and said, oh, we want to hire Ed. And she said, no, you gave it to the other guy. And we never got the story of like, was it a money thing or whatever? But I got the job and we moved up there in May. And first 25th of May was my first heart surgery operation. Wow. And you remember that day too. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. She <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in the middle, um, I, I was going to go to Montefiore 
um, for postgraduate uh, surgery training. Yeah. And um, I got in and um, they, uh, my wife was not quite six months pregnant at the time. And they couldn't say where they would house us when I would get there. And we had a sort of a phone call fight and um, I canceled and didn't go because they, what do you do? Show up with a, uh, you know, a U-Haul truck and a pregnant wife, 1200 miles and you know, we'll put you somewhere. But, you know, mm-hmm. anyway, I it, find out the PA that was at the hospital I went to is in Portland, Maine. Um, he had done that program, and then I hired one later on, and they said, you you didn't need it. But essentially, when I went up there, I had no clinical, I had surgery, playing surgery experience, but I had not done any uh, patient care, so to speak, mm. you know, histories and physicals and stuff. And so I was so green like a new grad, even though I was out for three and a half years, because, you know, first history and physical I did, the surgeon took it off the chart. <laughs> So, so when you, so as a first assist, that's all you really did was just first assist when you started. There wasn't like really rounding on patients or kind of just doing it on your own and then reporting to the physician. When did it transition to that, or did it ever transition? It never tra- transitioned at that hospital. Um, I didn't keep up more than a year, but um, I went to Maine and three surgeons were teaching me how to how to take care of patients etc and <clears throat> the training was in there in my head in the background <coughs> excuse me but um it wasn't fresh and i was real rusty putting lots and lots of hours in trying to recover what i had not used in three and a half years wow, wow. okay um what's the biggest change you've seen in the pa profession from when you first started practicing to now you it's just going to be really weird but you can pick up your your smartphone. You can go do up to date. You can do Hippocrates. You can Google search almost anything and learn almost anything. It's mm-hmm. it's amazing. I, I used to say uh, when you're a new grad, go somewhere with depth, not well, like I did, getting yelled at and being taught by three surgeons. Go where there are other PAs and, that can help teach you and bring you along. Right, right, uh, and I, Google. I had, to uh, no, I was saying now you can Google or YouTube how to like do a physical and watch it, you know, before going in. Right, and that that didn't exist, so it's nice that those tools are available. Right, so go to some place if you're a new grad, go to somewhere that you have depth and use those tools as a backup, but have somebody mentor you. And um, I did not approach it that way, but you know, I wanted to get into cardiac, and I was hard up to get a job, and I took what I could get. Right. It worked out. After the first year, I hired another, the, my next PA, 10 months into it. And that helped because he had experience and he helped help me get my head on straight. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have another question from a student. What was the hardest challenge while you were in PA school? Um, you know, keeping up with everything. Early on, I heard that we didn't have biochemistry as undergrad, so uh, they we could audit the class. It was a night class. It was one of my favorite professors, and we could just go in and listen and read the books. And but after two weeks, he had so much work piled on us, and we had eighteen yeah. other classes that yeah. we had piled on, and so we all dropped it because there was just too much doing. Um, one of the nurses from our unit. Um, has gotten into PA school in Emory and she actually just graduated. She said, you didn't tell me that PA school was going to be this hard. And I said, well, they're just taking the stuff of four years of medical school that you don't need and shoving the rest of it down your throat in one year. What did you expect? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's very, very hard. So challenging, guys, but it's doable. You can do it. Time time control is good. Exactly. What was the most challenging part of acquiring the skills necessary for cardiac surgery compared to other surgeries? The attention to detail in cardiac surgery means a lot. And not to put anybody down, but in general surgery, and actually general surgery back then was all open. The only people doing scopes were laparoscopic tubules and stuff like that. So open surgery, you can be a, a, a little bit sloppy, but you know, the attention to detail, I take vein for a lot of years and you didn't tie the side branch that bleeds later. They tamponade, they die. You know, that detail was critical. Fortunately, I have good um, aptitude for surgery and decent hands. So I could make up for 
any of it. But, you know, they um, one of the surgeons said, you know, Uncle Joe's not going to come off the table if on our thousand steps for this CAB aren't right. He's not coming off the table. That really impacted me. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. So um, we're going to move on to learn more about cardiac surgery. So can you tell us what a uh, cardiac surgery and critical care, um, can you tell us what, what a day in the life of a cardiac surgery or critical care PA is? Um, do you do like both in a day or how does that work doing though? I know they're similar. So is it the patients who sign surgery that then go to the ICU or how does it work? I'm going to go back to how it was in private practice. Okay. Because in, in the academic and Vanderbilt, uh, it's either OR day or a unit day, critical care. Okay. It's it's the way it's set up and it, it's okay. But in, in a regular cardiac surgery uh, hospital um, department, and especially in private practice, you come in in the morning, you look, you check on your ICU patients, see if they need any attention or care. And you, I don't know, some of them have intensivists overnight and some of them don't. There's like a thousand places in the, ho- in the country that do heart surgery. And so they can't all be as ramped up as ours is. Um, so you check on your sickest patients, you check on uh, the step down patients, right? Discharge anybody, then go to the OR. So you're automatically working because uh, most ORs put you on the table, patients on the table around 730 plus or minus, mm-hmm. sometimes eight o'clock. But so you're in there at six. That's where it was at St. Thomas. And we're doing third to the fifth most in the country. So you just went through the unit quickly. We didn't do step down and then we went to the OR and then we came out and pulled chest tubes and did history and physicals on the next day's patients or anybody transferring in and then um, discharge summaries. Yeah. And th- that was similar what, when I worked in Maine the first job, but it was a much, much smaller volume. We did 300 cases in St. Thomas. We ran in 1,500 to 2,400 a year. Oh my goodness. That was well, a- we had 10 surgeons and nine ORs, and I had I was ahead of the first assistants. I had 15, 16 first assistants. Wow. But there was only three PAs. Yeah. Three. So there's three PAs for the first assistant? The, the, yeah, of the first assist, of the 16, there was three uh, PAs that were employed by the group, and the rest were RNFAs employed by the hospital. Oh, okay, okay. So that's how we got the volume in, but we're the only ones doing the histories and physicals and the discharge summaries and pulling the chest tubes. Wow. Okay. But the, the intensivists were the anesthesia group. So I didn't really have to do critical care over there very much. Yeah. And are you ever on call? Over there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many call days do you have? Is it like a few times a month or? Oh, at Vanderbilt, uh, I don't have call, but it, instead of call, it's weekend work. Like I have to do three weekend days in every six weeks. Okay. And for the OR part, <clears throat> since I'm doing that as my main job is critical care, I don't have to pull OR call except for one summer holiday a year. Wow. Wow. Okay. And so when does your day typically end? Is it like the 12 hours? Can it sometimes be 16 hour days depending on the surgery? With the surgery, since uh, there are two RNFAs on call, it's not very common that I have to stay past 7 p.m., 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Okay. most of the time. Sometimes everything's done. We might get out early, but it's not predictable. Right, right. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So we have some more questions. Um, what do you think makes a great PA? Who, um, who would you be happy to work with or hire? Peter. <laughs> There's this guy that uh, asked to uh, me to shadow me in the ICU and the OR when he was 17, right? Yeah. And he's a high school student. I laughed at it. I said, why should I let him come? So he came and then he got a microbiology degree as an undergrad. He came again, right? Then he got a job as a care partner at the hospital for his patient experience. He finished PA school two years ago and he went and got a cardiac job out there in Oregon. <laughs> But th- this guy was attention to detail, a very personal, smart kid, easy to talk to, easy to talk to patients. Um, he, he's the, he would wish I, he he's who I wish I was. <laughs> he was he was very very good. Thank you, thank you. So you guys get that and hear that. That that sounds like a, he has a great personality. Um, that does sound like an ideal person to work with or hire. Mm-hmm. He had a good on his head, on his shoulders at 17. He worked uh, yeah. as a 
ER tech, I think he called himself. Yeah. Fact, you would know more about that. Yeah, <laughs> for, for his patient care hours, I'm guessing. Or just an interest in medicine when yeah. he was 17 and wow. an EMT also. <laughs> Someone said, be like Peter. Yes, guys. <laughs> Okay. Um, so what are some of the common, most common cardiac um, surgery cases that you see? We see a lot of uh, CABs, a lot of valves, uh, aortic and mitral. Um, mm -hmm. But we are the third or fourth year is the most heart transplants in, in, the, in the world. And so we're, those are all the time. And if you're not get a, if you not eligible or ready for a heart transplant, we'll put in left ventricular cyst devices. But then if you go to transplant, then it's a redo and it's kind of um, gnarly. Um, so there's a lot of heart failure stuff and impellas, ECMO. We have the whole gamut. And um, I looked it up earlier. There's about 115 centers out of the thousand that do heart surgery that are geared up for all those um, specialty uh, procedures. Right. Okay. Wow. And someone said, I guess they want, um, if you can give like a more detailed example of what exactly you do as a first assist um, relative to what the surgeon may do. Um, sure. Um, it, when in private practice uh, uh, as a first assist, and I would be the one across the table, no other surgeon there 99% of the time. Uh, if it was a CAB, I would take vein close the leg or leave a note for somebody that's floating around and to close the leg, um, go to the chest, um, help them go on bypass, uh, help them do, uh, I'm holding the vein, he's sewing, we're holding, I'm following suture, uh, he's tying, I'm cutting, and, or he's um, he, eye to eye, he cuts or whatever. Um, and then um, uh, closing the patient, coming off bypass, take all the tubes out, um, and he's putting wires in the chest and tighten. Then we're both sewing to close the chest. I've closed a couple hundred chests myself, but you know that was in private practice. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays we have so many fellows and residents. I'm second assisting more often, mm -hmm. but you know that's okay. Uh, just because you're a resident or fellow doesn't make you a smart first assistant. They're trying to learn to be surgeons, not assistants. Yeah. So they, so the chief likes us to be there to nudge the uh, resident fellow as they're new into learning how to assist. Right. Yeah, I was going to say that you're probably teaching them a lot as well. Yeah. And oh, can I? Can I? I'm <laughs> I've gotten a little bit better about not being grumpy. Uh, can I give you a trick? <laughs> you know, <laughs> can I suggest? <laughs> so uh, instead of some same gnarly thing I used to say. <laughs> all right um let's see we have a lot more questions just trying to do, not miss anyone what's the best advice you can give to um those of us starting out now is uh those wanting to become a pa what i tell uh the nurse practitioner and crna students that are just leaving us from the icu you don't understand as an undergrad and most of these people are undergrads the skill set you develop of uh, being a, a human sponge of a lecturer, right? You guys get your notes nowadays. We used to have to write them down real fast. But that skill set, this tension for an hour and really soak it up is very highly developed as an undergrad. And I think that's why the one PA in my class that flunked out, he, he didn't have that. And I say, read, study, work on sitting down and getting your brain attention to uh, learning because it's going to go full tilt like we were just saying when you get into PA school. You know, we had like 18 classes of lectures, not three a week, but, you know, patient interviewing and terminology and some of that's pre-school um, now. But it's amazing that that skill set goes. If I go to a conference and I'm trying to pay attention, my phone gets talked to and this and that. And, you know, it's the CMEs are are harder. And I think it's all that that skill set. Yes. Yeah. That's some great advice. Thank you for that. All righty, guys. OK, we're just going to answer a few more questions um, and then get into the case studies. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so someone I want to know, are there any books um, you've read in your career for fun or to learn skills that you carried into your work? So I'm blanking on the one I, I, we just read. It. Um, for cardiac surgery, John Kirkland wrote 
the two volume textbooks on surgery and they are gems for long-term keeping. Um, Garden of the Gods was the book. I really thought that was fun. You said Garden of the Gods? Yeah. Thank you. I put those in the chat, guys. Okay. All right. Let's see if there's, um, we'll probably answer two or three more questions, guys. All righty. What are your limits in all of those procedures? Not sure. What are your limits? Yeah. Someone wanted to know what are your limits in all of those procedures? I'm guessing how much you're able to do versus what you're not able to do. Uh, <laughs> being your uh, first assistant, you're not the one with the knife and the scissors all the time, even though sometimes you would like to be or with the bovi burning and, and stuff like that. Uh, that those are limits. But then if uh, the other question of limit is uh, the physiology of the patient, you know, uh, are they will they be able to recover from what we did? We can do amazing things and keep people alive on ECMO, et cetera, et cetera. But if uh, when you put the cross clamp on the aorta, it, it cracked it and set a shower of calcium up to their head and their brain and they have strokes, that's one of the risks of doing all this. Um, their their protoplasm wasn't going to tolerate it. Okay. And the, we are definitely limited by the patient's condition pre-op. Um, if they're, you know, you're doing uh, endocarditis and they're septic still, yeah, it's like, you know, you got one shot. If you can get it done and the antibiotics can get rid of it, you know, fine. But the protoplasm is the other limit. Mm, wow. Thank you for that. And um, I was going to actually ask, I remember, um, what was your toughest um, case? <laughs> You know, uh, there's so many uh, interesting, tough cases. Uh, the fun, toughest case was we uh, replaced the entire aorta and arch, and they t they call it a floating elephant trunk, and you st stuff the graft down the descending aorta, and through one of the side ports, you put a stent, and um, instead of sewing it, put the stent in and open up that graft inside the aorta, and that was really slick and that was a lot of fun. Mm, okay. Okay. So one last question um, before we move on to the case study. Um, someone wanted to know um, why you chose PA over MD or was MD ever a thought? MD had been a thought. I actually applied to one medical school and I did not uh, understand to apply successfully. You really need uh, coaching. The letter I wrote, my grades weren't fantastic. So, um, and then thinking about it, it's like you, like nowadays, it's most popular, more popular to go to PA school than uh, medical school because you can get it out a lot cheaper and a lot sooner. Right, right, right. So I was happy to stick with that. Yes, yes. And actually, before we go in, before the, um, if we went live, guys, we're actually discussing pay difference um, when he started. Um, Mr. Donahue, you said you made, what was it, 19000 when you started? No, it was 16 or 17 Actually, it was 16 Then I passed boards and passed the surgery boards, which were available back then. So they gave me a, another bonus to 17000 Wow. Wow, guys. $17,000 out of school, well, out of PA school. That's completely different compared to now. Mm -hmm. Well, PA school this semester was 3300 also. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Compared to what? What is it now? Like 10000 a semester, ten to 15000 a semester? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much so, um, so far for a great session. So um, we're going to let Mr. Donahue kind of take the stand. Um, he's going to be going over the case study. Um, I'm not sure. Do you have a PowerPoint or did you want to kind of just talk through the case study? I'm just going to talk through it. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, we had this 56-year-old uh, uh, gentleman uh, with a history of hypertension and complained of chest pain and went out to the other outside hospital. He ruled in for a heart attack, MI. Um, if you know about troponins, usually they're zero. His was 138. It's not the highest I've ever seen, but it was pretty high. And they went to the cath lab, of course, and they stented, I think they said five stents, in his circumflex artery, that's one in the back of the heart. Um, he was also COVID negative, and then we got to check everybody to treat him uh, when they're coming in the door. We have to wear the mask if we don't know. But it, he was at the outside hospital. He was okay. Um, on his third hospital day, 
um, he got short of breath and then wound up having to get the breathing tube put in. So they did a TE and it's transesophageal echocardiogram. I mean, trans, yeah, echocardiogram. And they saw he had severe mitral regurgitation. Well, one of the problems, am I supposed, they spoke, they don't ask questions, right? One of the problems, huh? No, I was going to say they usually ask questions after the case study. Oh, as during the case study, I'll wait till you're done to um, ask. All right, then I won't give that away. But anyway, they called us up and they uh, put an entry order. Our surgeon had said, uh, "Okay, transfer him down. We'll do surgery." And uh, we, um, they asked, he asked them to put an entry aortic balloon pump in, and then they can ask why. And um, they sent him down, and we did a mini mitral valve replacement uh, through the right chest incision about this big, another one in the groin that doesn't have the balloon in to put him on a heart lung bypass. Um, and then uh, did the surgery. He need, he required inotropes and then went to the ICU. And in that case, I would be the one uh, holding a retractor uh, during the part in the chest and helping cannulate the tubings into the femoral artery and femoral vein, and then sewing up both of those incisions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you guys have, do you have any questions for the students um, specifically about that case? Or do you guys have questions about that? Why did he have mitral regurge if he probably didn't have it before? He just had a heart attack. What happened? Does anyone know the answer? Or can, it doesn't have to be, you know, right, perfect. You guys are learning. <laughs> Let's see. Sometimes it takes a while for the answers to pop up in the chat. Anyone want to, uh, Take a guess at it. Why he had mitral valve regurgitation after the heart attack? Or after the stent, um, heart attack and a severe mitral valve. Does the balloon, oh, it looks like someone had a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> Does the balloon help your heart pump more blood? And then uh, which arteries are you focusing on when you place the catheters? The catheters to go and bypass the femoral artery and femoral vein. Okay. Somebody said, did the MI damage the mitral valve? Yes. And uh, as yes and no. The papillary muscle uh, to the two leaflets of the mitral valve, um, can it's fed by the circumflex. So when the MI happened, the papillary muscle died and then the the um, it let go. And so now you have severe mitral regurge. So, yeah, so I'm sorry. But the, then you get severe mitral regurge. It's very classic. Um, and then if you do go through the sternum, um, the, um, and somebody that needs a mitral, um, the atrium has not been stretched by long-term mitral disease. So the mini approach here, you get a very good look and very good fix. So, uh, and then there's no repair because that's the, the totally uh, blown out. So you replace it, not a repair. And, uh, the intraaortic balloon pump. Yeah. Um, uh, since you he so what happened to him he was slowly getting into cardiogenic shock over the two days before this yeah. and when he was on then he was on 100 percent on the ventilator and um so intraaortic balloon pump um is timed so that it's it inflates after the heart beats uh in diastole so that it pushes blood down the coronaries and up to your head and then it's time to deflate. And so you virtually have no pressure in, in the aortic root uh, when the heart our heart beats. So its work is much diminished, 30% or so. Wow. Wow. I, yeah, I see some, some people got that right. A heart attack damaged a heart muscle. Okay. And um, thank you for the exp explanation. Somebody asked, was he septic or had a virus? Doesn't sound like it. No. Okay. Yeah, I'll see a lot, a few people with the answers. So good job, guys. Okay. Smart people. <laughs> okay. So um, so we'll move on to the next case study, guys. Do you guys have any other questions about this one? Someone asked, what labs would you perform? Labs, the full gamut. We get loaded uh, blood gases. Um, that includes uh, blood sugar, potassium. Um, and cal uh, ionized calcium, which may, uh, that is key so that makes your inotropes work or pressors, excuse me. Um, and then uh, CBC platelets. No, we don't need uh, really fancy ones. And probably get liver function tests. Of, of, of course, BMP, uh, which is all your kidney um, information and your electrolytes. And then the day after a big surgery, we'll get a liver function test. 
um, and then keep it as long as we need it. Thank you. And how long are patients typically hospitalized after um, like major heart surgery? Uh, go into rehab and everything after. Uh, it depends on what their protoplasm was like before. Uh, regular CABs are probably home in four or five days. Regular valves, complicated valves like him, probably a week to 10 days, depending on how strong they are. Um, because, you know, he was in cardiogenic shock for, right. you know, two days. And then, then when you're in that, your kidneys say uncle usually, and their function goes down. And a lot of these people have to go on short-term dialysis, um, not necessarily for weeks, but maybe through a few days. And, you know, he got into trouble probably because he needed a lot of fluid off while his heart was going back, bumping backwards through the mi leaky mitral valve. And um, I actually had a question. Um, how did everything change on the, like during the height of COVID and since the pandemic? Uh, at Vanderbilt, um, it changed some. We limited um, surgeries to, to um, we did elective surgeries, but limited our, our scope. We were not required to limit it because of the service. You have to have it or people die. Um, so it didn't limit us too much of the hospitals filling up around us. And uh, ours was the last unit to get COVID patients. Uh, they had them going, they, they actually built a special COVID unit. And, uh, so it didn't hamper us too much, but we were all, um, aware to test everybody as soon as they showed up to, uh, for COVID before we we're going to operate. Actually, you know, the Bovi that we use to cauterize blood vessels, yeah. I found out the if you're covid positive the smoke of carry can carry covid and you can be inhaling that in the oh. or oh. wait a minute wait a minute wow. we used to joke about that stuff for you know, infectious disease but not I, that was a nuance yeah well i didn't know that <laughs> Okay, um, so we do have some questions. Do you typically follow up with your patients after surgeries? I'm sure you do. So what, what is the follow-up period like? My, since it's myself and you're on our own, like the first assistants uh, don't go upstairs and follow up on the patients. Since I'm up in the unit often uh, or scheduled, um, they'll ask me how so-and-so is doing, how that dissection go and all that. But I'll go and check on my patients. You're like, I, I went away. I, I took a radial for them last Sunday and then I went away for a few days and I didn't get to check on him, um, you know, his hand, but it's fine after surgery, but they have a tendency to swell and it hurts and three pillows is the answer. And I, like, I told everybody, but who knows what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I can when I'm here, but not for long term. Right. But I, you can, but that's another app. Like we have the Haiku app from eStar on your phone. So I can look up labs and notes and everything and all my patients as long as I keep them on my list. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you ever first assist in EP procedures like ablations, watchmen? <laughs> um, those procedures that I don't particularly like. Uh, yeah, we do um, some ablations. Uh, one surgeon used to do the uh, thor thor thoroscopic um, scope and do the areas that the EP doctor can't reach. And then he does the inside and they increase the uh, success of the EP procedures. But now we do an, what they call an end contact um, procedure where um, you sub xiphoid, you make a little incision, open up the pericardium and mm -hmm. slide a, a big tube in there. And then we can burn around the pulmonary veins and um, get those done. And, um, I can't comment on the success rate because I don't assist on that many of them. Right. Okay. And uh, someone wanted to know, have you ever seen a, someone with dextrocardia? Yes. Yes. We had one about two months ago. How often is that? Or do oh, you forget? That, that might be my third in 37, eight years. Wow. Wow. Okay. So it's pretty rare. Okay. Yeah. Righty. And I used to help with congenital surgery too. We have a, we do adult con congenital now, but I used to help in children surgery too. Okay. Right. Oh, that's nice. That's cool. Um, what kind of um, children's surgeries would you do? Uh, um, VSDs, ASDs, and um, um, patent ductus. Okay. Wow. And coarks too. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to oh, Early on, Blaylock tussock shunts, too. What is it called? Blaylock tussock shunt. 
Okay. Uh, what is that one? I haven't heard of that one. Uh, they you, you sacrifice the rights of Clavian and bring it down um, and sew it on the pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary vein. Uh, it's been so long. Um, <laughs> and then you you swing it down and sew it on there, so you have oxygenated blood recirculating. Okay. Yes. So it's kind of like tetralogy of flow, or yes, okay. for, yeah, because you can't do the tet repair until they grow. Uh, to about three years of age. Okay, okay. So yeah. it, it's a, a, what do you call it, a, a pre-procedure procedure. Mm, okay, thank you, thank you. I'm learning. <laughs> okay, um, someone wanted to know, oh, we didn't do the second case study. We can, um, before I answer more questions, let's do the second case study, guys, and then we'll finish off. Okay, um, this is a 39-year-old gentleman, history of uh, hypertension, a smoker, cocaine use, previous gunshot wound to his left lower extremity, also had some pre-op uh, kidney um, problems, okay? Presented to the outside hospital with tearing back interscapular pain, but also associated with, it with chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting. Outside hospital did a CAT scan, CTA with, with dye biopsy, and they said he had an aortic dissection type A, so ascending order, and would go around to descending, which is type B, and all the way down to the iliacs. Yeah. They life lighted him in, believe it or not. So what would you do? Or do I just tell them? Um, we can see what they say. <laughs> what would you guys do? Someone said the knowledge you have off the top of your head is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> years and years of work. <laughs> Yeah. Decades of experience. This is a pretty classic um, presentation of an aortic dissection. Right. The, right. It, it doesn't necessarily have to have chest pain. Just interscapular pain is enough. Yeah. Someone and, said rush to surgery. Hmm? Someone said rush to surgery. Yeah. We lifelight him in, went to the OR. Um, the uh, When the aortic root from the dissection dilates out, the leaflets of the aortic valve don't always reach. Mm. Right. So one technique is to put um, stitches in the commissures of the aortic valve, those three, to help bring that base together and then put a tube graft above it. And um, just they just did the tube graft. And there was a lot of bleeding, which is classic with these. So they left the chest open and um, then waited 12 hours. Bleeding was down, uh, went back to the OR and closed him. He got extubated the next day. And, and then, huh? No, I was saying he's young. I was going to ask him, why do you think such a um, young person had an aortic dissection? Go ahead. Are they going to answer that one? Yeah, let's see if they answer it. <laughs> why do you guys think a 39-year-old, usually those are, you know, um, older patients. Why do you guys think a 39-year-old would have an aortic dissection? Someone said they said drugs, cocaine. Yes, guys. Good job. And, and the hypertension. Yes. So then he got extubated. And the following day, believe it or not, he was delirious and um, agitated. But non-focal, he didn't have a stroke. Hmm. Okay, which is a risk of this whole, whole thing. Um, and then the next day, his lactate, which me is a measurement of low perfusion, just like you get lactic acidosis running too much and all that. Yeah. Um, and his kidney function got worse and his liver function test got worse. And then he got altered metastat mental status and then got reintubated with low oxygen hypoxia. And then they were going to repeat his CTA of his chest, abdomen, and pelvis to see what is going on with his aorta. Someone said withdrawal. Withdrawal? Yeah. I would guess that too, but we, it could be just delirium from that. He also mentioned to the nurse, uh, they, he also took other pills, yeah. but wouldn't tell her what they were. And um, his, his UDS, his uh, drug screen was negative when he came in. And we get them on a lot of our patients because we got, have been burned where the, they took the Xanax for years and the wife didn't know and he didn't tell anybody, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, let's see, there's any questions. Uh, someone asked, what is the life expectancy after? Oh, um, it depends on compliance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but this is, uh, this was actually was a trick case. I am in the unit tomorrow and he's going to be one of my patients. And so what I told you all was current from last night. I did not get any records from today. I'll get report here about a half hour. 
Oh, so wow. I'm going to be taking care of him tomorrow. So wow. uh, my role in, as intensivist uh, PA, you were asking about that. Um, I'm the first line to the nurse at the bedside. Right. So so she she would on this kind of patient. He's still delirious. We have him on dexmedetomidine. It's not doing it. Yeah. Uh, what what else can I give him? He's coming out of the bed. I have him in restraints. I'm afraid he's going to tear his ear. You want his pressure at 110. What do you want to do next? This, this, this. So I'll get report in the morning on him at six. I'll go see him at eight o'clock. We make rounds and present multidisciplinary rounds and talk about the patients and the plan. In the meantime, I'm taking care of potassiums and blood sugars and blood pressures and stuff um, to the bedside nurse. And then after rounds, I put in orders and we'll go back over the plan of the day and what we're going to do all day. And just because you have a plan, oh, do this for his agitation. That sounds great in rounds. But then when it's not working, I'm either escalating the dose, talking to my intensivist or my fellow in the, in the unit. They have more patients than me. I'll have four to eight, four to six patients usually. So as an intensivist, yeah, I, it's nice to have the backup. And then also you can talk to the surgeon, but the um, intensivists are great and they're allowing the surgeon to be home and asleep, getting over his all night surgery yeah. uh, or he can be operating. So um, it's a fun role. Um, and I like the balance of being in the OR when seeing what's going on and being in the unit of following up, as you guys asked before. Okay. And then at six at night, I give report to the night nurse practitioner PA. Okay. And I'm um, someone. Why would you not be able to sedate the patient? Sedate? Uh, if he's intubated, he's sedated. This was in between. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. So, so he's getting, and this is common in in the ICU. ICU delirium. And, you know, they, if their lights are on all the time, people lose their day night sleep cycle, and it really messes them up. And then different medicines uh, will mess can mess you up. But then again, what withdrawal is he going through? Right. And so we asked the family, OK, what are the pills he takes? Can you check the bottles at the house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we've had <coughs> patients with amazing amounts of oxy and other stuff that, you know, you, you kill an elephant. And if they are not and we think we think we know, give them this much, give them this much. But they might take five times that. Mm -hmm. At home. And, you know, then that withdrawal situation. Right. Someone said, um, oh, it sounds like incredible role, so many different aspects of medicine, correct? <laughs> mm -hmm. And you have like that dual role of going in the um, surgery and then um, transitioning to the ICU. That's mm -hmm. very intense, both intense roles, intense and very specialized roles. And it's not uncommon for cardiac surgery PAs to be like this, mm -hmm. but usually it's it's that's their everyday, their OR and unit or LRN step down, right? Yeah. Just that Vanderbilt's um, men mentality is you have to do one role or the other each day. Mm, okay. And But but I can tell you all around the country, it's only in academic centers, I think, is it going to be like that. So how many days are you in the OR versus the um, ICU? I, uh, two years ago, I cut down to three days a week, and I alternate two and one this week and one and two the next week. Okay. So um, it it's it gets a good mix and um, gets some downtime and um, you know I, I say that they get tired of me I go downstairs to the OR and if they get tired of me out there I go upstairs to the unit. <laughs> okay. So um, we will answer a few more questions. We're almost done, guys. So thank you so much for those case studies. The second one was, one, one was very interesting. They were both interesting, but the second one especially, um, you know. 39 year old with the aortic dissection. That's really interesting, especially it being a real case. So um, good luck with that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so someone wanted to know, as far as um, this is a really good ethics question, is there ever a time you had to make a difficult decision of who was priority, whether it be ethically or two very time urgent procedures? That No, the surgeons are making those decisions. Okay. I can maybe try to influence like, Okay, like he wants to do this case now. Okay, but I think that's not going to make it mm. if well, you take four hours to do this surgery. Right. It's not like hernias; they're going to take thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, you know. And I've had uh, a real problem with this one. I thought they had to go back 
for Tamponade. And he said, I think they'll be okay. And they were okay. But in the end, another surgeon took them back. Mm -hmm. So th that was a difficult for me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So yeah, ultimately it's up to the surgeon, but um, I'm glad that, you know, you try to put your input and um, I, I'm guessing that, you know, especially with your years of experience that they generally, you know, respect your um, opinions and your uh, input on um, cases. Yeah. It's, that's a very nice aspect. And out of our 16 intensivists, I think 11 or 12 were, trained here fellows and are on service with me so now they're my bosses and so we have this very nice dynamic that's good that's great okay has your own it looks like i think this one um you've had both experience with um someone asked has your personal experience at learning centers been profit been better than for-profit hospitals because you've worked at both uh worked at both uh different because i have much bigger pool in the academic center of of people that can teach me. I, I one of the things I like, I lifelong learner. I'm learning something every day from somebody. Sometimes it's the scrub nurse. The scrub nurse, put, you know, the, the the screen. I didn't know you could put a light handle and move the screen so you could see it better. It's like, oh, you know, it's so I can learn something from everybody. And but I have depth of knowledgeable people that can teach everything. And then my mid levels the nurses. One teaches me Facebook, one teaches my, uh, my iPhone watch or whatever. <laughs> so it's like, I learn from everywhere. Right, right. Um, so um, someone I wanted to know, have you ever performed a cardio version? Oh yeah, all the time. Internal or external, both, yes. Wow, I mean, and not uh, that you show, you, do, you can just kind of go in and do that on your own as a PA. Uh, usually we set it up and, and do it together because you have to give uh, sedation. Oh, right. Yes. Right. So um, you know, or, or you can do it without sedation. They'll be really mad at you. <laughs> uh, um, so um, so um, I usually have my uh, fellow or uh, intensivist come and give them a little bit of propofol, dial it up, put the pads in the right places and and shock them. OK, thank you. And. Okay, this will be the last question, guys. This is a good question, especially working um, in, with critically ill patients. Do you ever think about your patients outside of work, especially those that have passed away or those that are crit critically ill? I'm sure that, you know, that's happened, especially as you get cases coming in through your phone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there was this one uh, lady I was deathly afraid to put her on my prayer list. Uh, she was a lung transplant and had three times had to have her chest reopened for tamponade and other such things. And then she got um, uh, infected with Canada um, uh, yeast in the bloodstream. And we didn't think she'd make it because she was on and she was in there for two or three months. We just got a picture of her in clinic and she's doing great. That's awesome. Was she a diabetic or had a you know immune system? Immune system? Just bad, bad, bad luck. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, yeah, I do do uh, hang on to my patients mentally. And, uh, um, yeah, it's very nice to see the the things you didn't think would ever do not make it. Because they asked me if I were seeing anybody respond and get over it. And I had not. And she's the first. And I'm happy about it. Yes. And the family, as much as you tell them, I'm, I'm a PA, I'm a PA. Oh, oh you're, you're Dr. Ed in our family. You're Dr. Ed. <laughs> Okay. No. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Donahue. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. You guys, it's um, about the end of our session. Um, just as a takeaway, what is one last final advice you'll give to all these students? We have 180 tuned in right now that's watching you, that's preparing, you know, to go to PA school, to apply to PA school. What's, what's one advice you want to give them in their journey? Um, do it. <laughs> Yes. Um, put everything you can do it. Thank you. 42 years and I love it still. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, for just, you know, being a PA for 40 years. I'm sure you've seen a lot. Um, so, so much has happened as far as, you know, just legislation with, you know, PAs, the healthcare, changes in healthcare. So thank you for your time and service to the profession. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. And um, before we go, 
Ed said it was fine to contact him. Um, we have a lot of praise in the chat, by the way. Um, somebody said, I'll definitely do it. Thank you so much. This was an amazing session. Thank you. These are college students, so thank you. You're making a, a big difference. The majority of them are in college, so thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for this great information. This is interesting. Didn't know PAs can do so much. Uh, you guys, I'm going to put his email in the chat. I haven't even told you half of what I've done. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get a ton of emails. <laughs> so I put his emails in the chat, and I'll put my um, – Instagram and email as well, guys, um, if you have any questions for me. Okay. So thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Clock. Um, have a great, great, great night, Mr. Donahue. Thank you for coming on, and we hope to have you again in the future. <laughs> sure. <laughs> thank you. Good night. You can click the um, end button, the, the red, like, hang up button to end the session. All right. Thank you very much. You did a good job as a moderator. Thank you. <laughs> you made me feel easy. Thank you. I tried to moderate the chat and keep up with you. So thank you. Did good. <laughs> thank good you night. so much. Good night, guys. Bye. Bye.